So these are my five biggest fails on Amazon in 2021. This is gonna be a bit of a sales update video uh, and I'm gonna talk about specifically, pardon me, the things that have just felt really tough for me this year. This, this is things that I got wrong, decisions that I made that I could have made better, um, things that have cost me money, cost me time, cost me energy as well. Um, and there are five of them that I wanna talk about. So the reason why I'm sharing this with you, I hope that you can learn something from either the specific problems that I've had and the challenges that I've been faced, uh, that I've faced, how I've dealt with them and the things that I didn't do right. Hopefully you can learn from that, those specific challenges and then, cause you may be facing them too. And if not, I don't know, sometimes it's just nice to hear that other people are going through difficult things as well. And we, because we all do. And so maybe you can feel good, feel better about that, that like I'm failing these things too. And if not, then maybe you can get some value out of how I'm approaching these things. Um, so you can apply the same thought processes or the same mentality to whatever challenges it is that you will face in your Amazon business or in your life or whatever it may be. So if you like that, make sure to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel if you want, and let's go. So let's start with an Amazon overall sales update before anything else. And I guess I'm happy that I've hit a recent milestone of 15 million and that's in total lifetime revenue, right? So to give you all context and before we get into it, I've now been doing this for a while. I have a lot of accumulated experience doing this. I've actually, yep, I've been doing this for longer than I ever worked in anything else. So this is now my longest career, so to speak. But my point for you is that as I'm coming to you and being like, wow, these probably quite big numbers, like 15 million and a lot of that's profit. So that's that's fantastic, that's life-changing. But I've been doing this for a while and it wasn't, you know, these numbers, they started pretty decent, but like they've only recently scaled up to these heights. And that's with just a lot of experience, um, a lot of accumulated capital, you know, knowledge, everything that really takes time to develop. That's one thing. And the second thing I want you to understand as well is that if you're watching this, you're probably either on the outside thinking about starting an Amazon business or you're more in the beginning phases um, and maybe you, you have one or two products or something like that. Please understand this is uh, the sort of brutal or honest truth. Maybe it's not, it's not brutal, but it's the honest truth is that back here, starting back in 20, end of 2016 when I did, or 2017, 2018, whatever it was, the this period back here, it was a very different game. I don't know, I genuinely don't know if I was starting today in 2021 or 2020, if I was the same person that I was back then with the same experience that I had or lack of experience with the same amount of money, basically me back then when I got to start, if I was starting today, would I be able to still succeed to this level? I'm not that confident that the answer to that is yes. I think, bit of a side point, I think you, if you're starting today, you have a higher chance than before to make an even bigger impact than, than what I've been able to do. You can make even more money, you can sell your business for even more because that pathway is reliably defined now and it wasn't five years ago. However, that chance is still very small. Most people will never ever make it to that point, including, not including you, but like statistically, probably including you. Um, and I'm, I'm a statistical outlier and many of the other people you see on YouTube as well are also statistical outliers who've kind of beaten the odds. That's a, that's a, that's a higher chance, but it's still a very small chance. And I think that the chance that you probably don't do anything with this business or you don't succeed or you launch a product and it goes nowhere, or you just never try or whatever else it may be, basically do not succeed in, in changing your life or quitting your job, whatever, whatever it is that you want. I think that chance is a lot higher today than it was back in 2016. So just bear that in mind. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm not trying to sugarcoat this. I'm trying to give you a realistic expectation as much as possible as to what you will be facing if you do choose to start this business or you are continuing with it. Keep in mind though, that if you if you wanna go for the, you know, what is it like the, not a base hit, the opposite. I don't know my baseball. If you wanna whack it out of the park, you wanna to go to the moon, you do have a much better, um, pathway and, and roadmap to do that today than you did five years ago. So if you're thinking big, if you're thinking eight figures, if you're thinking nine figures uh, or multiple seven figures, whatever it is that's like on that big goal side, yeah, you can, you're can you gonna get a high multiple for your business. You are going to be able to execute and, and potentially do that just much faster, much more reliably than before. So it's both good for certain uh, group of people and bad for probably the majority of beginners, so to speak, who are coming into this space. Again, I just don't sugarcoat things. That's how I see it. So that's my lifetime sales update. Been great. Uh, I'm super happy to be here and happy to have started this business and changed my life. Over the last 12 months, how are we looking? Uh, we're up to 8 million, which is really cool. So reflection on this, 
Firstly, understand that, again, I've been doing this for five years, but half of that total, more than half of that total came in the last 12 months. And that is really a function of exponential growth. And that's what it always looks like, is like, if you keep growing and you're able to just keep driving things forwards, uh, all of that first stuff, the actual benefit, like in financial terms, what this is saying is that more than 50% of what I've made in my entire time doing Amazon for five years or whatever, all came in the last 12 months, all came in the last one year. So that's totally skewed. And what you need to understand is that the financial return, and this is gonna be even more skewed if this business, uh, so it's generated profit up until now, but now it has value, right? You can sell your business um, for a particular multiple. If you include that sale value, so it's the value of the thing that you're actually building but haven't yet realized, the the it's just completely skewed towards the end. So you could be working at this for two years, three years, four years, five years, and basically not get any of the real value until that last day that you sell the business and maybe a bit after that as well. Understand that because what you are doing is you're building up skills and experience for all of that time. And then you're finally getting this final payday, like right at the end, you know, it's like when you hit the finish line. Um, so if you don't like delayed gratification or you want things like now or today, um, you're gonna struggle doing this, or at least you're gonna really struggle to, to realize the true potential benefit that is out there, which is huge, by the way. So I know I started on a downer in terms of like the probabilities, statistically speaking, like are not that high, but the payoff is huge. So if you, again, you wanna hit it out of the park, uh, just bear that in mind. So this is the last 12 months, how are we looking? We're looking flat. I'm gonna get started, uh, sorry, I'm gonna get into the first failure of 2021, and that has been not COVID itself, my failure has been to correctly account for what COVID would do to my business. So firstly, the positive thing here is, this looks flat. Uh, obviously, apart from the seasonality, we have a seasonal business, so that's that's to be expected. Um, we did nearly 2 million in December, which is amazing. That's again, what we were doing like the whole year of 2019 or 2018, almost. Um, but through all this COVID stuff over the last 12 months, we've actually been able to maintain a pretty stable level of profit above 100K per month, which is great because, so this is the positive side here, this is not the fail, but the positive side is I've seen many other businesses, uh, whether at this scale or around the scale or a little bit smaller or a little bit bigger, whatever, that have really tanked hard, um, basically coming into this new year because all this crazy shit that's happened is just, I mean, you know, I'm not even gonna describe it in this video. It's just like so much shit on so many different levels in terms of consumer preferences. What are, what are people doing at home? They're in home, out of home. Um, they're thinking about their life differently because of COVID, their, their, their habits, their behaviors have changed. Then you've also got all of these um, complex system ripple effects of like these fluctu fluctuations in demand and then all these problems on the supply side and all this crazy shit basically. It's just like these like ripples going everywhere and who knows what the fuck's happening. Um, but anyway, many businesses have actually suffered a lot on the tail end of that because either new competition, which wasn't able to come in and capitalize in the first six months or, or let's say, you know, when COVID hit and everything started going crazy, um, or even people were adjusting, people were like, oh, I need to start working online now. Why don't I start an online business? All of that stuff takes a while to catch up. It hasn't really caught up yet, but what it means now is that there is a lot more new competition coming in. Um, demand is not as, because people are starting to go back to their normal life again, if you were looking for things that were COVID positive, now in 2021, well, maybe you're on the tail end of that. Maybe you're, you know, you're too late. And actually things like travel are starting to come back. So a lot of businesses are just being churned up inside this like chaotic mess. Uh, whereas we've been okay. We've been able to keep it relatively flat. So what was the fail? The fail was me just really not seeing what was sitting in front of me. Because even though, yeah, we've, I've done okay, you still need to be able to forecast these things. You need to be able to, if nothing else, for inventory forecasting purposes, you need to know how much inventory to order because that's where you're putting the big, the big money down on the table. And for us, that's, you know, that's up to a million dollars in inventory. That's a lot of money for me. Definitely a lot of money for you. It's probably a lot of money too. And the basically the efficiency of that or the risk involved with putting that money down on the table, that goes up or goes down based on how much you're ordering and how correct your forecast is gonna be or how, how accurate your forecast is. So for me, I academically knew, and I've talked about it on this channel, that like as this goes up, there'll be some effect that will stick around as people are, you know, for me, for example, I shop on Amazon more now than I did before, a year ago. Um, so that habit for me has been very sticky. 
But at the same time, the larger factor is like, well, what are people actually doing? What are their actual behaviors? Are they sticking around inside? Are they buying things for the home? You know, they locked down or are they going back out to the real world again? That's all a macro thing and that all depends on COVID. And I thought I had a better understanding of it and it turns out that I actually didn't have a particularly great understanding of it. So essentially what I wanna show you is just this sort of most obvious example of it is here in April, this is for the UK, our UK sales. And it's a clear example because in the UK, unlike in the US or most, maybe probably the US is the dominant market, but let's say in the US, every state was controlling its things by, by itself. It's like, you know, are people staying at home? Are they locked down? Or are they just gonna go out again? So it was really like much more gradual thing. Whereas in the UK with country level control, the reopening date was the 12th of April. And you can see here, we basically, so we were out of stock. We didn't plan Q4 that well, or, you know, we, we blew out of stock for like two, three months, which is not ideal came back in, but we were hitting 6K days, um, 2K in profit, which is amazing. We're like, wow, our launches in the UK are so good. We were just patting ourselves on the back, like look how amazingly we've done um, and making plans into the future based on this high level without realizing that it was still a temporary thing. And actually it wasn't until after the fact, it wasn't until about a week after the 12th of April or maybe a week, something like that. And when we saw on, on that day and the day before and then the day of and then the day after, basically our sales pretty much dropped by 50%. Overall, it was maybe a 30% drop, not a 50% drop, but like that was a very stark drop in a few days. And we're just like, oh crap. Like, we went from patting ourselves on the back to damage control mode. Like what the hell is going on? What do we need to do here? We messed something up. Like is, you know, is it <laughs> um, something wrong with our listings or what, what's going on? Um, but in hindsight, it was really obvious. It was literally just that day is when everyone had better things to do than buy stuff on Amazon. And so they all went out and were enjoying life and not buying our products. Uh, and that stuck around. And you can see that that's basically the new normal is like the way things were almost. So I could get more into this, but effectively, you know, if we'd be making long-term plans based on this small data set, well, we would have really got it wrong. Um, and luckily we were able to pick it up pretty quickly of like, okay, <laughs> Let's, let's look at what was actually happening around this day. Like, why did it drop? Oh, it's a macro stuff, it's COVID. And so that's, that's the first fail. I think for you, you should understand that it's very, very important that you're able to do these forecasts, not to 100% accuracy, but you actually understand on a fundamental level, like what's going on with your product, what's going on on different levels, right? So you've got the macro, that's, that's COVID. That's like, what are the bigger picture things that are changing? Um, then you've got a level down below that, then you've got, I guess, like seasonality, things like that. What's what's changing within, let's compress that all actually onto one sort of layer and just go, do you actually understand your product and who's buying it and why they're buying it and what habits and behaviors they are trying to fulfill when they're buying your product? You know, some, sometimes it's really obvious like winter stuff versus summer stuff, or this is a Christmas giftable item. But I do talk to a lot of people who are newer at this, who don't really have a deep understanding of what the product is actually used for and therefore will it be more giftable for Christmas or less giftable for Christmas? Because there are some products that are actually less giftable and, and sorry, sell less during Christmas. Um, other things are obvious like fitness. Okay, obviously January is gonna be the, the main month for that, but you need to have a very clear and fundamental understanding, not just looking at keywords, because um, sometimes you pick the wrong keyword. <laughs> Again, if you don't really understand like what's going on. Um, but it's super important because that's how you're gonna drive your inventory purchasing decisions. That's how you're gonna make your long-term sales forecast, your growth forecasts, all of that sort of stuff. And it really comes down to understanding what's the product, how's it getting used, and what are the factors that will actually change that. So in this case, I messed it up really bad because we didn't see it, even though I knew what was gonna happen, I didn't see it until after it had happened, which is really not ideal when you're making plans three, four, five months in advance. So that's the first fail. Um, oh, and and I guess the more humbling thing as well was it was that after looking back, so after I'd realized that I'd messed it up, and looked back and gone, oh, okay, well, now I got to adjust again. Uh, I was listening to a bunch of podcasts and interviews in the aggregator space, and like they were all clearly on top of it. They were like, yeah, just wait for like April, May, and you'll see this big drop. And you know, we're just waiting around to see what happens then. And it was like, it was just staring us in the face and staring me in the face, and I didn't see it. So that's fail number one, not predicting the COVID drop off. Fail number two, Germany. So I've got here a screenshot of the email from our VAT service, we use Avask, but I, I blurred them out. Um, Say, good afternoon, I hope this email finds you safe and well. Great news, your VAT number is now live. This is your German VAT number, obviously blurred out, and the tax ID number that you'll need for Germany as well. 
So if you don't know, to sell on in Germany or in Europe in general, it's now a requirement that you have a VAT, VAT number. You just need that number. If you don't have it, they won't let you sell. They'll actually block your account. So until we got this email, uh, our German account was blocked, right? But this is great news. We got, the, we got the VAT number, so we're good to go. Why is this the biggest fail? Why is it the biggest fail that we received this VAT number? I'll give you a hint. The big fail part of this is, can I highlight this? <sighs> it's the fact that we got it on the Wednesday, the 28th of July of this year. So that's less than a month ago. Now I've just flipped over to our plan, which I think we made, we made it in November, November, 2020. How are we gonna get our business from where it was around about five to 6 million up to 10 million per year? And you can understand why it's been such a fail for us to get that um, VAT number in July was basically the way we mapped out this growth plan was pretty simply, I don't really believe in doing super, super detailed forecast because the forecast is really just, you know, you're just uh, not a forecast, sorry, super, super detailed long-term plan because it's really just guiding your sort of more discrete granular actions. Um, so all I did was just go, all right, like this is what we can do right now, roughly. And then how do we get to that next number, the next milestone? What do we need to do? We need to go from that per month to that per month. And then I just try and fill in the gaps of like, okay, well, how we get there? So the way that I did that was going by marketplace because our marketplace expansion was our single one. Or it's either number one or number two, I forget right now, um, like highest priority actions that we're gonna do to, to bridge this gap, to get to where we needed to go or where we wanted to go. And we just basically wrote it out as like, all right, well, we're not selling in these marketplaces, but we can probably add on 70K per month in Germany, 20K per month in the rest of Europe, uh, 90K per month in that like almost already gets us to where we need to go. And so what's the issue? Why is this the biggest fail? Because this plan we set in November of 2020, that was when we already had our VAT registrations in progress. We were already going through the motions of basically opening up these marketplaces, these European marketplaces to be able to sell. What happened for us to wait, have to wait it was definitely more than nine months. I can't remember the, the exact length of time now, but why did we just get this number in July? The answer is, I have no idea why it took so long. And the fail is that I didn't account for the fact that I had no idea how long it was gonna take. And the this cost us a lot of money. This cost us a lot of money because we actually shipped stuff into Germany. So we were making these plans. We we're like, all right, like, here's the gap. How do we fill the gap? We register for VAT, we know we need to do that. And we just like send inventory there and we'd already done the keyword research, everything, it looks good. German marketplace, by the way, if you have VAT, which is which should be easy to get, um, I'm really bullish on it. I think it looks fantastic. So we sent goods to inventory, sorry, we sent inventory to Germany uh, to store there. And then we basically got everything ready, listings all ready to sell. Everything was completely set up, PPC campaigns all ready to go. And then we even sent in inventory from the 3PL, which was being stored straight into FBA in Germany. And we did that in, I don't remember the dates. I think it was around about November of last year. Fast forward six months of not getting the VAT number and it's turning into a big fail because now at this point, we've had inventory stored in an account that's now blocked because it has no VAT number or suspended rather. So we can't sell, we can't use the account we have inventory sitting there incurring storage fees of around about a thousand. I wonder if I can actually look at this here. Let me go to Germany. Um, basically, we're incurring storage fees. There we go, minus 30,000. Sweet. Can I see it? You can't see it, but it's better, you can't, better that you can't see it because that's roughly how much we had to pay in directly in storage fees. <laughs> 30,000 in storage fees. That doesn't include the shipping or anything like that. That also doesn't include the 20 to 30,000 in fees or, or in inventory that we had to destroy because it was sitting in journey for too long. And then it started to be, uh, we were incurring overage storage fees, pardon me, overage storage fees because uh, we had hit our IPI limit. So this is really kind of annoying for me to talk about, um, but you know, it needs to be talked about. So. That's not true. It's not annoying to talk about. It, it's frustrating that I went through this because looking at this, there were some simple failures. Basically, when you don't know what the timeline is gonna be for something, 
you can set estimates, right? But what you should be doing and what I should have been doing and what I didn't do, what I failed to do was consider what the worst case outcome is. And really, if you just always protect yourself from the worst case outcome, you'll do pretty well. You'll do very well, actually. And in this case, the worst case outcome was that we didn't get the VAT number for a very long time or forever. And we never thought about well, what happens if we ship this inventory into the 3PL, fine, they can, we'll just pay the, I can't remember how much it was, but it was cheaper. It was a lot cheaper in FBA, more expensive. And specifically, if if we extrapolated out the worst case, let's say we have to wait two years or something for a VAT, VAT number, what happens then? Well, obviously your IPI is gonna start going down. You're gonna get hit with uh, long-term storage fees. And that inventory just can't sit in Amazon for this indefinite period of time. It's not practical. You will have to destroy it because you will have to, um, because the alternative is just paying tens of thousands of dollars per month potentially uh, in, in long-term storage fees. Now, I don't know why I didn't think about that worst case outcome because that's something that I almost always do. And the simple solution, which would have worked completely fine, would have been to do everything else except for ship that inventory into FBA. Literally, we were saving you know, the shipping time, the processing and shipping time from 3PL into Germany of less than a week. So it would have just delayed our launches by a week, but had if we had had everything else ready, that would have been the only difference. Uh, in the end, that single decision to just try and save potentially one week cost us, again, this, this, I don't know if this is completely correct, but that's the fees, that's the storage fees. Then we had to dispose of the inventory, which we disposed of, by the way. Um, so this was 28th of July. I think we disposed of the inventory maybe at the end of June. <laughs> So we waited a long time and then disposed of it and then got our VAT number such that we could have kept selling the inventory that we just disposed of. Um, so let's say it was minus 30,000 in profit and maybe another minus 20,000 or 30,000 in inventory destroyed. So that's 60K plus all of the effort and the energy um, going through all of this plus the leveraging factor, which I don't know if I'm gonna talk about it later in the video, but understand that if you're planning on selling your business, the anything that makes money or loses money is actually magnified by your sale multiple, your expected sale multiple. So if your business is worth a 3X multiple, and let's say you just lost $30,000, then you actually dropped off. So you lost the $30,000 in profit. That's 30,000 out of your pocket. And then you also took off 30,000 times three equals 90,000 from the value of your business. So you lost 30,000 and then you actually lost another 90,000 in value. So you lost 120,000 when you thought you lost 30,000. So for us, our multiple should be higher than 3X. So this was a very expensive mistake. This was hundreds of thousands of dollars basically lost, uh, plus all of the effort invested, not plus the delay because the delay would have happened anyway. But the key failure here and the one that's frustrating, I'm sort of like fidgeting in a frustrated way as I talk about it because it was pretty annoying, um, was simply not considering what happens in the worst case and in the worst case, are we still okay? I mean, we are okay, but like mitigating the downside risk so that's number two, Germany VAT delays. Failure number three, overloading my team. So what I'm gonna share with you now is the business plan. I don't know if you call it a business plan, but this is what I have as my business plan document. And this is basically status update. Where are we right now? I wrote this at the start of 2021, pardon me, or the end of last year, basically. And the idea is like, get you know a health check of where we are right now, and then what is achievable in the next year, the next 12 months. So we have, again, like a, a, a guideline or a roadmap to follow. And also how do we actually get there? Like, what does the road look like? Um, and for us, it was really about, again, in the middle of COVID, in the middle of this being in this upward trajectory, it was really just like, okay, we're very easily growing right now. We've got the demand. What do we need to do to grow to greater than 10 million a year? And why 10 million a year? That's because that's a very conservative way of getting to a 10 million valuation. Um, and why do that? because it's fun and we're doing well already. So let's just keep playing the game and you know have fun doing it. Principles to work by was basically expanding everything to every marketplace right now. That's the, the principle, right? So that's, then you can understand what's the actual bottlenecks or constraints that you can run into. This is not talking about constraints. This is just like, ideally we would just get everything out there to every single marketplace immediately. And, and then we would have these network effects from basically all of these reviews accumulating across marketplaces, um, which has kind of changed by now. Um, but that's what it was at the end of the year. And then what, we, what else we do? Um, 
launch to pre-exhaustion. So basically like having stuff still on the sidelines, but not leaving all the best stuff on the sidelines. Because if we're thinking about selling the business, you want to have this like happy medium of like, you've still got stuff to give to the to the new owners. You can still keep that trajectory going, but you've also realized some of it yourself so that you've actually increased the value of the business and yeah, and working less. So I'm showing you this. I don't mean to go through this whole thing, but what I want to show you is this failure in foresight, which was that I basically assumed and I can't remember if I said this earlier in the video, but like when you're on an upwards trajectory, it's really easy to just assume that that upwards trajectory will continue indefinitely. It's like the base case for you to just think that you will keep getting better and better and better. And I see this, uh, I mean, I've seen this myself internally a lot. My own psychology is that that just happens. And I also see it very, very predictably in newer sellers because you haven't experienced those up and downs yet, which inevitably come. Like very rarely does a business just go to 10 million or 20 million or whatever it may be. Sometimes, yes, but um, you know, once in a blue moon. Normally to get there, you have to actually go through a bunch of growing pains where you'll grow and then something will just go wrong or shit will hit the fan in, or in some way, or you realize that you really fucked something up. And so actually you actually need to go through maybe not a declining phase, but some sort of stabilization for a while while you work your shit out basically such that you can then grow to the next level. Almost inevitably, that's how it will happen um, in, in most cases. So the failure, team overload. This was my plan at the end of 2020, going into 2021. And what we're gonna do, we we're basically just gonna keep everything the same. And what we're not gonna focus on is, so everything is, here we go, everything is working, keep doing the same thing. What are we not gonna focus on? Building processes. We've got, what we, we have what we have and it works because we can see how much we grew before to get to where we are. And so therefore, if we just keep doing the same thing we were doing, then of course, we'll just get more growth, right? We'll get exactly the same trajectory. Um, and what are we not gonna focus on again from last year? This is again, this perspective of the incorrect perspective of seeing your previous trajectory and assuming that you can just do it again. So the problem here, this is the root cause here and the root failure. I had scaled 3X without changing the team, which was um, Michael, Juan, Murat, Angel. I don't know, team of, team of four, let's say, team of five max. Um, and not all of that is full time. So big failure, assuming that we could just keep scaling with the same team. Um, I said hiring max one person and that was wrong. <laughs> that was really wrong because um, for us to get to our goal, the, the goal of 10 million per year, basically very quickly this year with the one of the next problems that I'll talk about in the next fails is logistical. And that's just like things getting more complicated, more management overhead. And it took a lot of time for us to kind of grow into this level of sales. Um, and basically I kind of fucked up. Me, I don't do that much in this business anymore, but I do set the plan. I do set the vision and I am responsible for setting the direction of the business and with the resources that it has. And if it doesn't have the right resources to go where it needs to go, well, I'm responsible for, for identifying that problem and fixing it. And I basically said, all right, team, you guys do you and we're just gonna keep growing. We're gonna hit this like stretch goal. And then what happened very quickly, start of the year, team ran out of time. Um, particularly Michael, who I've talked about on this channel, he is my outsourced brain. So he's not no, low level at all. He really has, to be honest, more in-depth uh, perspective of the inner operational workings of the business than I do, much more in-depth. And that's great. I like it like that because then he can <laughs> he can worry about all the stuff that um, I don't want to have to worry about and I could focus on this, um, which only works until I fuck things up and, and get it wrong. So he very quickly hit a limit where... As it turned out, he wasn't able to do the high level stuff, which is the entrepreneurial stuff, which is like this sort of vision stuff. This is building processes. Um, this is this is the higher level stuff. What else do I wanna say? Just thinking things from the big picture, doing the risk management, um, picking the pathway, if not the whole big picture vision, then at least like on the shorter term timeframes, picking that, rolling it forwards. He was really not able to do that because he was too busy focusing on managing shipments and all of the supply delays and all the crap that um, that has come in 2021. And I mean, that's it, that, that's it really. Failure number three, it was me not picking the, like seeing that this was gonna become another point where it's like, oh, actually this is gonna be a stability phase where we actually need to think about the long-term future and plan accordingly for this long-term future 
which means giving the business more resources. That means, and in concrete terms, uh, the way that I see it is like, you've got the business owner slash CEO type role. Then underneath that, you have some kind of different functionalities. One is gonna be the Amazon operations side, which is gonna be basically logging into Seller Central and most of the stuff associated with Seller Central. So that's like PPC, that's gonna be listings, that's gonna be maybe marketing and stuff as well. To me, I, I consider that, you could maybe put marketing outside, but I put that like, this guy does Amazon, all the listings, all the growth, blah, 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 all the marketplaces, Amazon. And then on the other side, I think external to that, you have in uh, inventory, logistics, um, supply, basically. So that's the guy talking to suppliers, that's the guy doing shipments, um, talking to freight forwarders, managing the goods on the way into Amazon, including 3PLs, all of that sort of stuff. So you've got these two roles here, you can probably fit PPC under Amazon operations, or you can maybe put it external or PPC and marketing external. That is really the core of it. it, it it's that the Amazon business is those two things separated. And I can do another video on this in more detail, um, but, but that's really what it comes down to. And so the problem that we ran into was basically Michael going from, let's say manager slash, yeah, manager slash CEO. So ideally him being up there, he was actually filling these two jobs um, both of which combined were more than one job. And so what happens is stuff just falls, stuff to just like fall down. And so below Michael as well is um, our Amazon operations assistant and our supply assistant, right? So we have VAs that do that work and, and um, I don't wanna denigrate them using the word VA, like they do really important and really good work too, but that's just how much labor we have. And so Michael was basically split between these two and then just maxed out and it was, it was like this now, it's been like this for like three, four, maybe even five months, a while. Um, and, and I think the bigger failure on my part was that I actually started this year running this business very passively. So I think in January, I basically didn't work and didn't check anything. I, I was January or January and then February as well. I was literally just like checked out of the business. So two months, which was the critical time for me to look at the plan and go, oh, actually, hang on. I can see all the supply logistics stuff getting more complicated. I can see, you know, this is essentially the business structure. I can see where we're trying to get to and I can see this isn't gonna work. Now that was the time at the start of the year in those months where I wasn't doing anything to step up to my actual role and responsibility, fix this plan to adjust the plan. And at the end of the day to hire someone to be able to ease uh, to, to remove Michael from being the absolute constraint where he's just completely maxed out and all the stuff that he needs to do or needs to get done is just falling to the sides. And a lot of stuff did fall to the sides. So that's failure number three, um, sitting on me completely, which was to overload my team and then to not fix that problem. <sighs> and failure number four, freight costs going up. Now that's not a specific failure in and of itself. That's an external thing, right? So the, how can you actually fail around that? You can either fail to have cash flow sufficient to pay for it. You could make bad decisions, bad planning decisions around um, what products are profitable. You could do small things, I think, on the side of like not, maybe not accounting for those uh, costs going up or rather not doing things to mitigate the costs going up. Uh, I don't think that's where we failed. Actually, specifically, the fail was a pretty simple one, which was that we didn't, update our costs as freight costs going up. So um, you're probably aware of this, but basically like you can get a container for, I don't know, 3K, 4K, 1,000, like three to 4,000 US, maybe even less than that. I, I don't keep up to date with these things, but literally now it's like 15,000, 20,000 for, for the same container. That is a huge increase in costs. Um, we do sufficient volume such that we're at least filling containers. Like if you're not even filling containers, then you're basically you know, you're potentially screwed out of this market unless you can really increase price. But <laughs> the simple mistake that is a failure on my end was that I didn't update my uh, cost calculators, didn't update my, for example, shopkeeper, right? It's for this profit figure and this one and that margin, that requires inputs of COGS. Your COGS consists of your manufacturing cost, consists of your freight and duties and anything pa basically paid to get the goods into Amazon. So this is now updated. <laughs> so don't worry about that. This, this number is now accurate, but it was not for a long time. And so we were actually running our business operationally off costs that were out of date. And so luckily not too much changed. So we didn't launch products that like were just a complete dud because we hadn't updated them. Um, but it was a quite significant difference. 
and just not a good look because, uh, I mean, I think this is maybe the first time I talked about this on the channel, but uh, I was talking to a whole bunch of aggregators to get the valuation for this business. And that <laughs> requires COGS values and our COGS values were out of date. And so I was basically entering into a whole bunch of conversations um, saying something about the business that I thought to be true that, that wasn't. Now, luckily it wasn't a significant difference, but the fact that there's a difference and it was just these out of date numbers when I knew that freight costs had been going up, well, that's a fail on my part. So that's failure number four. I don't want to talk too much about it, but it's just like, you start to feel this responsibility or if you don't, you will, where when you see these things that are like, should be easy pickups, you're just like, ah, like, what am I doing? That's failure number four, freight costs were going on. And then leading me on to the last one, this has been a real roller coaster of the year. Just seeing these things, basically not getting the COVID drop off right, um, not making that simple change with Germany, not accounting for the worst case scenario, not allowing for the fact that we might not, you know, the German bureaucracy might not work that fast for us. Um, and then overloading my team. So definitely seeing people having to work harder than they should have had to work and getting worse results than they should get. That's not their fault. That's completely on my fault. That's completely my fault. Um, and then starting to take it externally where it's like just not picking things up that then involve other parties. Um, it has really made a mess of my expectations in terms of like, what is this business? Who am I to be managing this business, owning this business? And what does that all mean? And this one is much less of a defined one. Like, and I don't want to sort of end this on a, on a negative note, but like, I, I guess what I want to share with you is that <laughs> you've probably gone through some sort of emotional roller coaster as part of your journey already. And ultimately like that doesn't change. Um, if you haven't yet, well, you probably will at some point. And it's always like, what, <laughs> whenever you go through it, you just like, ah, oh, damn, like I didn't really expect this. And it's not great, so it's not always great. I, I really don't have more to say about this one, but yeah, basically biggest fail is like looking back and just being like, shit, like I had all of these sort of like lines planned out for things that were gonna happen. And it does feel like, although we are doing really well, I'm like, okay, let me close that one with the big German fail. But if we go to all time, like this is an amazing result. I guess my overall point here is like, zooming out, you see how it actually is. So to me, zooming out means this. That means looking at this journey and looking at everything that I've learned from all the mistakes that I made back here, all the mistakes that I made here, 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 and also up to today, I'm still making mistakes. Each one of those things really hurts, <laughs> no matter how much you try to make it not hurt. And sometimes you feel like crap because you're like, ah, oh, you know, I'm not, I'm not good enough to be doing this until you can really zoom out and, and just look at the big picture and be like, wow, like well done. So that's it really. These are my five failures on Amazon in 2021. Um, this was a bit of a sales update. Hope this video didn't run on for too long. Um, if it's still even running, it is. I'm not sure what the next video is gonna be about. Leave me a comment down below. What would you like to make me, what would you like me to make a video on? And uh, if I can help, I'll do so. All right, thanks, have a good one.